All right, looks like most of you are here. So let's get started. And um, as, my, as my colleague Walter Meal would say, let's light the candle. So for those of you who haven't heard just yet, I'm Janine Lamarca, Director of Client Services, Healthcare and Life Science for Jaros, Baum and Bulls. We are a 100 plus year engineering firm headquartered in New York with offices in Boston and Philadelphia. On behalf of our sponsor, JVMB University, who offers a unique program of technical professional development courses to both clients and staff alike, I am so excited to be here tonight to welcome you to this one of a kind event with a deep look into health assurance with Dr. Stephen Clasco, Jefferson Health CEO. So I believe health is a human right, and I'm super passionate professionally and personally about healthcare and its overarching ability to help others. So I joined JBNB because of the firm's commitment and values placed on its healthcare clients and partners. And when Chris Prochner, my new partner and colleague, shared unhealth care with me, I immediately embraced and appreciated its ideas for creating a new way of looking at healthcare. You can imagine how thrilled I was when Dr. Clasco accept our invitation to be here tonight to talk about this important topic. It's, it's really addresses, uh, not only addresses healthcare in our industry, the AUC industry, but also the potential for improved health and wealth well-being for all people. So without further delay, I'm proud to introduce this evening's moderator, Chris Prochner. Um, and because his bio is so impressive, I'm just going to read it to you. So Chris Prochner has been a partner at JBNB since 2005 and the leader of the firm's healthcare division for the past 12 years while growing and developing a 50-member team spanning all trades. He's worked with some of New York's most renowned and respected medical centers and research facilities and has established himself as a key player on campus master planning projects. He spearheaded the master planning of NYU Langone's post Sandy recovery effort. And last year at just this time was leading the MEP design of SUNY Stony Brook's 510 1028 bed alternate care facility as one of the initial responses to COVID-19 in the New York area. He is currently bringing his intense focus to the patient experience and the patient environment at Jefferson Health Specialty Care Pavilion in Philadelphia. Chris holds a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering and a Master of Management from Polytech Institute of NYU. Chris, over to you. Am I on? Excellent. Janine, thank you so much for that introduction and special thanks to our marketing communications department for making me sound so good. I didn't think I was that good, but you guys really put a, put a cherry on top of that one. So thank you all. Um, welcome everybody. Seriously, I can't be thankful enough to have everybody join us tonight. Uh, I'm sure by late on a Thursday afternoon, everybody zoomed out and running on fumes especially Dr. Clasco, who has traveled a very long way to be with us tonight to get on this call. Um, it's 81 and sunny on the other side of this wall, and I'm in serious need of vitamin D therapy. So I'd rather be on that side of the wall, but promise me, I promise you all that this is gonna be an insightful and uh, unique discussion. And unique in two ways, both in content and in format. Uh, in terms of content, I know most of our audience represents the construction and A&E industry. Um, and I can promise you, we are not talking about modular construction. We are not talking about project delivery methods. And as an engineer, we are certainly not talking about carbon and energy, All right? So we are gonna talk more about uh, why our healthcare system is broken and how we can all contribute to fix it. Right? As for format, it's gonna be dynamic and engaging. And we'll get to that shortly. We'll see that in, in just a, a few minutes. Uh, before we get into the introduction of Dr. Clasco, I'd just like to briefly discuss how we cross paths. Um, we are fortunate enough to be the engineers for the Jefferson Health Specialty Care Pavilion. And as we were sitting in program meetings, 
and listening to requirements like we want to be the most technologically advanced, we want to be uh, cutting edge, we want every MIOT device that could possibly be in this building. Okay, pretty tall order. So we had to do a little bit of research and, and figure out what all this kind of stuff meant. As we just did the research, we, we came across this book and, and obviously the author. Uh, and as an engineer, we take the product of these two items, the programming meetings and the research that we did. And that what does that sum up to be? It sums up to be Jefferson Health, the specialty care pavilion will serve as America's first model of healthcare assurance with deep commitment by its leadership. So let's get into it. I'm just gonna read quickly Dr. Glasgow's uh, bio. So tonight we are pleased to welcome Dr. Stephen Clasco, a longtime advocate for the transformation of healthcare and higher education and a genuine pioneer in using technology to build healthcare assurance and equity. As president and CEO of Philadelphia's Thomas Jefferson University and Jefferson Health since 2013, he has led one of the nation's fastest growing academic health institutions based on his dynamic vision of a reimagined healthcare paradigm. Before becoming president and CEO at Jefferson, he served as the Dean of two medical colleges and the leader of three academic health enterprises. For three years, he has been listed among the top 100 most influential people by modern healthcare. In 2020, he was named the first distinguished fellow of the, of the World Economic Forum and currently co-chairs the World Economic Forum Board of Stewards for the Future of the Digital Economy and new value creation. Along with under, on healthcare, the book we will be discussing tonight, he's also the author of Patient No Longer, Why Healthcare Must Deliver the Care Experience Consumers Wants and Expect, and Bless This Mess, The Picture Story of Healthcare in America. So we're super glad and excited that Dr. Clasco can make it here tonight after traveling all the way back from the future. Hi, I'm Steve Clasco, and I've had a hell of a morning. This morning, I woke up in 2030. Now, back in 2021, I was the president of Thomas Jefferson University and the CEO of Jefferson Health. Now, I'm the chief digital officer for the United States under President Taylor Swift. Yes, the Swifties became a real political party. And the president has just received word that there is a mutant strain of an RNA encapsulated virus that's been afflicting people in Australia. Of course, People old enough to remember, especially healthcare workers, the dark days of 2020 and 2021 and the COVID-19 crisis immediately panicked, but only for a second, and then they smiled because they knew that healthcare had evolved from a broken, fragmented, expensive, inequitable sick care system to a health assurance system where most of their care happens at home here in 2030. Since most of your healthcare data is now continuously streamed to the cloud and AI bots are constantly analyzing them for any changes, the early symptoms of this new virus were immediately identified and anyone throughout the world who exhibited those early symptoms was notified and asked to socially isolate. If needed, their employer was notified and asked for an excused absence. Software was immediately sent through the Internet of Things what we now call the Internet of You, so your home 3D printer could begin to create masks for you and your family. Those who were having panic attacks, remembering the COVID-19 crisis of 2020 and 2021, could immediately communicate with their bot psychiatrist, and if necessary, could immediately receive drone-delivered treatment. There were no lines or concerns about food or supply storages for the same reason. Humans are not the dependent variable, as the fourth industrial revolution, drones, AI, internet of things, and robotics, have modified the supply chain, and there's no reason to congregate in crowded grocery stores or hoard toilet paper. The whole scare was over within a month, as new bioprocessing techniques were able to identify, develop, and test vaccines through rapid prototyping. Oh, by the way, instruction for K-12 students continued seamlessly 
as the United States had finally reached broadband in 100% of households by 2025. And just as healthcare at home was mainstream, so were creative ways of teaching in a variety of venues. Okay, so, so now let's travel back to the present in 2021. I'm committed to working with you to make sure that that brief time travel is indeed a reality. A far cry from what we witnessed in my hometown of Philadelphia and throughout the country during the COVID crisis of 2020. While not enough can be said about the frontline healthcare heroes at Jefferson and throughout the country, data was scarce and not analyzed in a coordinated fashion. There were different strategies in different states, in some cases, different counties of the same state. Jefferson Health went, as I said, from 50 telehealth visits a day to over 4,000 a day. But many health systems did not have the bandwidth to accomplish telehealth. And speaking of bandwidth, most public schools shut down for months as cities such as Philadelphia had a large percentage of the population without broadband or computers at home. The war on the underserved, which is what historians called the reaction to the 2020 COVID crisis, forced a change in payment models so that every aspect of the healthcare ecosystem was compensated for keeping populations healthy. Food deserts were eliminated through drone delivery and enlightened social and educational food programs. Payers and providers aligned once doing better, not doing more, resulted in higher payments. It was not an easy road. The dirty, not so secret of healthcare in 2020 was that almost everybody made more money when more people were sick. It was hard to get big institutions excited about changing something when their revenue depended upon them not changing it. So the healthcare industry had failed to transform itself over many years. Consumers, business owners, and all rational people recognized how healthcare had escaped the consumer revolution as they watched hospitals fall and insurers have record profits during the COVID crisis. They watched the underserved and minority population dwindle because we had failed to address the social determinants, and they recognized that things that they took for granted were difficult in healthcare. Even telehealth, believe it or not, in 2020 was viewed as a new technology. That failure of entrepreneurs and the traditional healthcare ecosystem to get together urgently to disrupt healthcare became incredibly visible throughout the COVID epidemic of 2020 to 2022. Throughout the crisis, no one worried about groups of people congregating at banks to get their deposits checked because everything they should have happened in healthcare had already happened in banking. The data was continuous, owned by the consumer, and almost all transactions could be done at home in 2020 in banking, unlike healthcare. With health assurance, we moved from the Internet of Things to the Internet of You. I remember back at Davos in 2020, the CEO of a banking conglomerate came up to me and said, you know, 20 years ago, the true groups that had totally escaped the consumer revolution were banking and healthcare. Now you're alone. Think about how the pandemic, even back in 2020, would have been handled differently if we had continuous data coming in from patients through their wearables and other sources as it related to temperature, respiratory rate, and other vital signs. Or if 3D printers were as ubiquitous as cell phones. Simply put, in many cases, our care back then, our cars back then got better care than we do. They were constantly sending data to the cloud. It's hard to believe, but only 10 years ago in 2020, people were going once a year for a static physical to an office, as opposed to what we have become accustomed to, your T-shirt sending continuous data with AI filtering and human interaction when necessary. For example, the discrepancy between those healthcare systems that had a strategic alliance with a payer versus those that didn't came into sharp view during the COVID crisis. Healthcare providers were forced into canceling elective or non-essential surgeries and outpatient visits, the very services that brought in the dollars for the fee-for-service sick care world to subsidize the money-losing chronic care management. Meanwhile, payers that already received their premiums had huge reserves and were paying out much less because these services were not being performed in order to conserve PPE. Since the system was not set up to be nimble, COVID pneumonias, by and large, were paid for as run-of-the-mill pneumonias, despite the fact that the expenses for the provider for that care were often quintupled. Bottom line, providers were forced to put thousands of employees on furloughs or layoffs, insurers were able to decrease their medical loss ratios, and patients who lost their job often also lost their health insurance. For places like Kaiser and other integrated payer provider systems, they were to work out the economic maelstrom. 
Everyone else was left to react and fend for themselves and their employees. All in all, great progress is made in delivery of health, and the transformation would not have been as dramatic if not for the COVID crisis of 2020. In some respect, in a weird way, more lives were saved over the past 10 years because of the pandemic of 2020 to 2022 was a jolt and lightning rod for American healthcare to have an extreme makeover and for the sick system to finally get well. So how do we get from 2020 to 2030? Well, I want to take you back. I had an opportunity to work with Apple uh, in the pre-iPhone era. And John Scully, who had become the CEO of Apple to sort of get Steve Jobs to understand corporate America, had asked Steve to come up with a strategic and business plan like they had at Pepsi, which he ran. John's view of that was a very large, glossy brochure with spreadsheets, McKinsey, Accenture helping out. Steve's version was simply this. Here's my three-year business plan. Year one, we change. Year two, we change the industry. Year three, we change the world. So how do we change? Well, a book was written by one of my mentors, a guy named Bill Kissick at Wharton, who literally talked about the Iron Triangle of healthcare. The book was called Medicine's Dilemmas, Infinite Needs, Finite Resources. Sound familiar? And he said, there's an iron triangle of access, quality, and cost. If you increase access, you either have to increase cost or decrease quality, and you can go down the, the geometric line. He said, unless you're willing to disrupt the system, and disruption is painful. And literally, for that whole early part of the decade of the 21st century, think about what our health policy was. The Affordable Care Act, President Obama said, this will increase access, increase quality, and decrease cost, and it won't be painful. That's impossible. President Trump said, my health care program will be terrific, fantastic, unbelievable, and huge, and it wasn't. But the simple fact is nobody wanted to do the disruptive things that would have really made the difference. This is healthcare's Amazon moment. If you're a provider and think you're going to go back to your business model, solving being based on hospital revenue and not relevant to people who want care at home, I think you'll be out of business. If you're an insurer and you think you can just be the middleman between the hospital and the patient, you'll be irrelevant. If hospitals believe that innovation could just be this cute little thing that they do in the background, but the real business is just getting heads and beds, they're nuts. I think we were always wondering what the big disruption would be that got us to join the consumer revolution, and I really believe that this is it. So let's think about the Iron Triangle in a very different way, from the patient's point of view, because people don't view themselves as patients. They view themselves as people they want to be able to thrive without health getting in the way. They want to be able to connect and have human relationships with healthcare providers when they need it. They want to be able to easily navigate healthcare on their own terms like they can every other part of their life. And they also want to be able to understand what they do. And understanding is different than transparency. Transparency is CMS saying that I have to put my charge master 2800 page Excel spreadsheet on the internet. Transparency is, I need a hip replacement. I run half marathons. I want to know, based on your outcomes, what are the chances that I can do a half marathon in a year? Exactly what will it cost me? What rate of readmissions do you have, and who will pay for it? What do patients say about you? And then I want to be able to go to other providers and get that information, just like I can in every other part of my life. That was the main thing that changed. At Jefferson, we made that decision in 2017, that we were going to go to a four-pillar model, what Steve Jobs used to call the old math and the new math. The old math was making computers and operating systems, which was the only math back then. The new math was the digital lifestyle. In our world, the old math is tuition, academics, and our 14 hospital system. The new math was innovation and strategic partnerships. And right around 2020, the Innovation Strategic Partnerships pillar actually became our most successful pillar. So the question for us when I got a chance to take over Jefferson in 2013, can a 195-year-old academic medical center act like a startup company? And we made a few assumptions. 
We assumed that we would get paid based on quality, cost, patient experience, and outcomes. We assumed that our hospital stays would become commoditized. We assumed that our doctors and nurses will not only have to uh, work with, but cooperate with deep learning entities. It took us about 50 years to get doctors and nurses to work together. Now we're gonna have to get doctors and robots to work together. We also recognize that if that's the case, that we need to select and educate our humans differently. And the population health, predictive analytics, and social determinants really need to move to the mainstream of clinical care, payment models, and medical education. When I started out in obstetrics, what would happen is a young woman would think that she might be pregnant. We do a pregnancy test, go to her family doctor, say, congratulations, Mrs. Jones. I'm going to send you to my obstetrician, Dr. Clasco. The chances that a 28-year-old person today will just take that advice for the most important thing in their life from a 64-year-old male primary care doctor are zero. So she'll say, well, that might be who you'd go to if you get pregnant, which you, you probably won't. I'm going to talk to friends. I'm going to look on the internet and decide who best matches what I need. So we decided actually to create that match.com between patients and providers because finding the right doctor shouldn't be so hard. Same thing with remote monitoring. We're working with a company that literally can do most of pregnancy testing at home. Now think about this post-COVID, not just immediately, for years to come. The chances that a patient that needs three times a week non-stress tests will say, oh, let me get this straight. You want me to come into Philadelphia, pay $35 each time to park, go to a place where there's a lot of sick people, go up in an elevator, have somebody put a monitor on me that's been put on 10 other people so I can stare at the ceiling and have a nurse come in in two hours to tell me that the baby's normal. When I can do that at home, while I'm binge watching my favorite show with a glass of lemonade. That's really the difference that once people start to see those alternatives. And I really think Jack Ma at uh, Davos last year really put it best. No matter how artificial intelligence is good, human being in the future compete with machine on knowledge, you don't have chance. Computer is always going to be smarter than you are. When there's a car, forget about it, who runs faster. When there's a plane, don't think you can fly like a... When there's a computer, you know, computer is always smarter than you are. They never f forget. They remember everything. They never get angry. They calculate faster. But computer can never be as wise as a man. What's the difference between smart and wisdom? So how do we change the world in healthcare? So let me tell you what scares me about the digital acceleration caused by COVID-19. It's that we'll get it wrong. We have this unprecedented opportunity to shape this 30-year industrial cycle that will transform almost every sector of the world economy. We now know that digital technology will be ubiquitous. We'll stop calling it digital, just like we don't call it telebanking. But it's our responsibility to get this right, to create the restructuring of the next 100 years that will leave the world a better place. We now know that this new technology will be infused throughout the world economy. That means the pressure is on us to make sure it's done responsibly. In some respects, that's why Heyman and I started talking about on healthcare. We're convinced that truly putting the person in the center, whether that person is a patient or not, can integrate healthcare, make it consumer friendly, but also solve the health disparities that help create 20 year life expectancy gaps between zip codes in America. But only if we design the unhealth care system with those disparities and with that ethics in mind. So what happens if robots and humans actually start to work together to provide better health? I wrote an article for Modern Healthcare after my time at the World Economic Forum, and we're actually working in that stakeholder capitalism world about recognizing that the two crises that really do not have any borders are both climate change and healthcare inequities. So here's what happens once you go from sick care to health insurance. I, I mentioned the pregnancy model of the difference between having to come into the hospital three times a week to get your baby monitored versus being able to do it at work or home. So what does that have to do with disparities? Well, the simple fact is that we are somewhere around number 45 of 100 developed countries in maternal mortality and neonatal morbidity. 
Now think about that. Why is that? With all the resources we have, we're by far the most expensive. It's because of that, uh, that gap. And just think back to the testing model. If you're, if you're a wealthy person, no problem coming into the hospital three times a week, paying for parking, taking the time off. If you're in a very different situation where you can't take that time off, or you can't afford childcare, or you don't have money for gas in your car, what you do is you just don't get the testing. Once we democratize that testing, though, by being able to do it at home, literally we're able to make significant changes in, in maternal outcomes. There is no reason, no reason, that in a place like Philadelphia with six academic medical centers should be a 21-year disparity between going six miles on either side of the Rocky statue. So one of the things that came out of our Davos discussions were that we need large-scale transformations in healthcare to both survive as a business and have a positive societal outcome. And again, I believe that COVID will be a nidus for that. The fourth industrial revolution will give us the tools and data to do this, but we need to proactively address the human and ethical consequences up front. And healthcare and academic success, two areas that really need to go through disruption, will require changes in our way of thinking, creative partnerships to create new ecosystems. And by the way, there is no such thing as non-disruptive disruption. It will be painful for those who don't want to think differently as these new ecosystems are built. That's been true in every area that's been transformed. Think Sears and Pennies. Think travel agents that didn't get the importance of e-travel. Oh, and what about food deserts? Well, think about this. In 2020, the reason there were food deserts was because certain zip codes, those one with long life expectancies, might be able to walk to two or three Whole Foods or Trader Joe's. The ones with much less life expectancies could only walk to a bodega that sold corn chips and sodas. And they might not have been able to afford, afford the gas. The combination of enlightened health policy and drone delivery of food changed all that. The enlightened health policy was that if you're willing to give your, your family healthy meals, we'll give you 50% more electronic food transfers if you're on food assistance. And by the way, we'll drone deliver to you, literally eliminating food deserts. Just one of the examples where smart policy, AI, and a human component made a difference. Oh, and the final mandate for AI, we finally started to learn from our mistakes. Fun, sexy, safe. Just like that guy, we keep making the same mistake over and over again. So we started to look at simulation in a whole different way, transplanting medical advices, advances in knowledge into improved patient care through procedure rehearsal studios. I'm a private pilot, and every two years I have to get my technical competence assessed. As a surgeon, nobody's assessed my objectively my technical competence in 30 years. In fact, we talk about the way training is. If you ask any surgeon, how did you learn this procedure? See one, do one, teach one. That makes zero sense in 2020. And over the decade from 2020 to 2030, that went away. Just to give you an example, I learned how to intubate a one and a half pound baby in the middle of a chaotic delivery room. Now, nobody does that until they've proven that they can do it on one of these simulated little one and a half pound uh, robot babies, knowing that they can do it safely before they get to a human. Jason Kidd got traded to the Dallas Mavericks, uh, and the team had been 24 and 52. And at his press conference, this is what he said. We're going to turn this team around 360 degrees. 
We do a lot of turning things around 360 degrees and ending up in the same place in healthcare. And that's what really had to change starting in 2020. And most importantly, if there's one thing that this crisis has shown us is that we have to have to have to start now. Thank you very much. So let me give you a few surprises uh, and really cut the suspense. You did start in 2020. You did make those changes. You did go from sick care to health assurance. And that's why things are so good in 2030. Oh, and by the way, one other surprise. I'm not really me. I'm a hologram of me coming back to let you know that you're just about to start a renaissance in healthcare. Dr. Klaus, welcome back to 2030. Fantastic. Thank you for joining us. Sure. I'm glad to see we have uh, better political choices in the future, uh, <laughs> but more importantly, we have a better health care system as well. So to kind of kick things off, I'd just like to start with you know, the, the most fundamental. What inspired you to write this book and, and make this movie? So, look, I think... Um... Uh, I, I, first of all, I've been a fan of science fiction for a long, long time. And I found that um, when things get really tight, we, we started with one of my professors in Wharton, something called history of the future. If I ask doctors what's going to happen a year from now or two years from now, their sphincters tighten and they talk about, you know, malpractice and all the things they're worried about. If you start out with a, here's what 2030 looks like or 2031 looks like and give an optimistic scenario or a pessimistic scenario, what happened in 2021, 2022, 2023 to get us there? People get a lot more creative. So most of the books that I've written have really been around a science fiction theme. I bless this mess book, uh, presumed that, that, that um, Jefferson, uh, not Jefferson, that the United States healthcare system joined the Intergalactic Council of really cool, awesome healthcare systems. And they were amazed because when they went back in 2019, America was a mess. But the reason that, that that was cool is because I could write some things that if I had just written them as essays, I would have gotten killed. But doing what other planets have done and you know, saying they got rid of insurers, they got rid of lawyers, whatever it was, I could do that because that's what another planet did. So I, it gives you a chance to, to really, really become uh, uh, more creative. And to me, the key is getting people out of this sort of incremental approach, right? And that's why in the, in the video, I talked about what if this was the Amazon moment? You know, um, at the end of the day, when Amazon disrupted or when Airbnb, and, and the person I wrote the book with, uh, some of you may or may not know, Hey Montanasia started Airbnb, started uh, Stripe, started Warby Parker. And if you think about those three things, and he wrote a book called Unscaled about how the 21st century economy is going to get away from mass production and into personalized, customized space. So if you think about Airbnb or Warby Parker, they said, Warby Parker, I don't need to build more mall stores and lens crafters. I'm just going to make it easier for people to do it at home. And if you think about Airbnb, you know, everybody else said, well, if you're going to build a bigger, better hotel chain in America, you got to build bigger, better hotels. No, I'm going to build no hotels and just connect people that already have real estate. So we got together sort of, uh, you know, under the, what if a Silicon Valley entrepreneur and a CEO of a 195 year old academic medical center walked into a bar, got married, and had a kid? What would that kid look like? What would happen if you took the move fast and break things model, Silicon Valley doesn't always work, and the mission driven approach of, of healthcare, but is very risk averse? You know, what would happen if you did a fusion of those two? And that's, that's sort of what we've done at Jefferson, that's what we've done with Haymont, and that's what was behind the book. Gotcha. So using that holistic approach, you think what we want to do for the, for the first part of this, this discussion is really involve the audience and go through a number of poll questions. This way we get some input from them and it's not just a dialogue between us going back and forth, asking some questions. We include everybody. So let's bring up the first poll question. All right. And what are the greatest ob obstacles to health assurance? Um, if everybody can make a selection, and over the next couple of seconds, we'll, uh, we'll get the tally and see, see where the uh, answers fall.
You should have it all of the above, Chris. I think, you know. <laughs> I know, I know. I didn't want to give that away. That was part of the my uh okay, my sorry. <laughs> Look at that, it's barely, barely even split. 45% um, payment methods, 47% uh, culture, and 20% technology solutions. Um, and, and you took the words right out of my mouth. You know, it's it's all of the above. You wanna go into more detail why it's all of the above? Yeah, so so look, I think there's a great, um, we'll start with payment methods. There's a great Upton Sinclair quote. It's hard to get somebody to do something when their salary depends upon them not doing it. So if you just look at what happened during the pandemic, and as I mentioned in the, in the video, you know, it's just, it's just asinine, frankly, that we'd have a situation where American hospitals will lose a couple hundred billion dollars doing the right thing. And American insurers that did nothing illegal quadrupled their, their net operating income during, during those surges. Why? Because the American healthcare system is how much can I get from the employer in November or December? And how little do I have to pay out? And, and it's what's called medical loss ratio. So at the end of the day, and, and by the way, we're just as guilty because the way we pay doctors is ridiculous. If I do more care, not better care. In fact, it used to be even worse, Chris. It used to be if I, if, if I was a surgeon with a 0% wound infection rate, and you were a surgeon with a 20% wound infection rate, you made more money than I did. Because every time you brought one of those patients back to fix the wound, you could charge. Now, 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 we've, now we've, we've amended some of that, but we still don't have the right payment models. So clearly what has to happen is there has to be strategic alignment between payers and providers. At Jefferson, we're doing new relationships with all sorts of providers around what we call percentage of premium models. Where, where now I'm getting, I and the insurer are getting, are getting incentivized for, for care. So let me give you an example. In 2012, we started one of the largest telehealth entities. Now, you know, going to my faculty and, and talking telehealth in 2012 is like, like teaching Satanism. It's like, like, are you kidding me? We're an academic medical center. And frankly, we got to the point where we could move 50% of our patients out of our expensive, inefficient ED, emergency department, into urgent care, telehealth, and appointment the next day. Much better for the patient. We would have gone bankrupt because the insurers were willing to pay us $1,500 if somebody shows up to my big emergency room and we do lots of tests and an average about $89 if I, if I handle it closer to home. So what do we do? We're the second largest employer in Philadelphia. We took our 32,000 employees. We're on the payer, on the provider, on the, on the employer. And so it's a $500 deductible if you just come to RED. It's a zero deductible and you pay nothing for an admission if you get admitted, if you get to RED through Jeff Connect. Change the behavior and, um, and patients were much happier and saved literally a million dollars a month. So I think we're starting to expand those kind of value-based pieces. The culture thing I think is really important. And, and, and um, you know, when I graduated from Wharton, I got a million dollar grant to look at what makes doctors different than depending on the audience, either uh, other people or normal people and how we handle change. Because it hit me that um, when I was going to Wharton on the weekends, and I was one of only two doctors at Wharton's MBA program, and it would be like, wow, you were so lucky to be in healthcare, a $3 trillion industry going through transition. It's going to be a mess. What a great opportunity. They were thinking like entrepreneurs. Then I would go to the doctor's lounge and be doing surgery on Monday, listening to my counterpart saying, medicine stinks. I'm telling my kids not to go into it. I wish things could be like they were 20 years ago. Same input, but entrepreneurs and business people were saying, this is gonna be a really turmoil tsunami change. That's gonna be good for me because I can be creative. And doctors were thinking by definition, I'm an autonomous, competitive, hierarchical, non-creative person that won't be able to make that change. So what we did at Jefferson that I'm very proud of is we, we, we created something called JOLT, Jefferson Onboarding and Leadership Transformation. And what we found, and we did this nationally, is that 20% of the doctors get it. They, they, they like what you're doing, they'll follow you. 15% of the doctors will never get it. And then there's the... Um, then there's a 65% in the middle. What was fascinating, Chris, is we found that we as leaders spend 40% of our time with the, with the docs that get it. It's probably true in your industry also. The people you like, you want to play golf with, you want to hang out with, they like you, they're telling you how great you are, you want to spend time with them. We spend 45% of the time with the folks that will never get it because you know they're loud and we can 
talk them out of it. And the least amount of time with people in the middle. At Jefferson, what we did is we said, all right, we're going to spend less time with people that get it. We're going to teach the teachers, let them become the mentors. We're going to ignore the people that will never get it. We call that administrative hospice. We just let them be comfortable and, and peacefully go away, hopefully to a competitor. And then we, we've concentrated on the 65% in the middle. In six years now, we've now gone to, to 20, 65, 15, to 40, 45, 15. And we just published a thing for Sloan Business Review where the people that went through Jolt, the doctors, have a 325% increased loyalty to the organization, are much more willing to take chances and do things like that. Well. So we're starting to create a different culture. So you're right, you, you, you can't do it without changing the payment model. You can't do it without changing the culture. I think the reason that technology solutions um, was probably less is because I think five years ago, that would have been the biggest impediment. But there's so much money being put into technology solutions. It's just a matter of how do you get them together with the traditional healthcare ecosystem. I don't think we're gonna be at a shortage of AI and 3D printing and drone and genomics and, and other things as far as solutions. It's how do we inundate that, change the payment models and the culture so the doctors and nurses will use them and it actually makes sense to do the right thing for the right patient at the right time. Can you talk a little bit about the payment model that Berkshire Hathaway came up with? with it was what, JP Morgan and, and Amazon? Did yeah, but you know, you know, that, you know that, that failed. So, um, so you know, and actually it's, it's really funny what happens, you know, um, Everybody's waiting for big tech to get into healthcare. So, you know, when Amazon, JP Morgan, and Berkshire got together and formed Haven, every healthcare stock went down 20%. Okay. Now, I had actually gotten asked to, to, to get involved with that. And the guy that ran that was a guy named Atul Gawande. And brilliant guy. And some of you might, might know Atul. He's a neurosurgeon up in Harvard. Uh, he also writes for the New Yorker, um, you know, and um, so, but, but he was the CEO of this, we're gonna transform healthcare. And, I, and you know, he said, oh, I'm still gonna operate. I'm still gonna write for the New Yorker. And in my spare time, I'm gonna to totally transform healthcare. So, you know, I got in a little bit of trouble in, in Twitter because um, I was giving a talk a week after that happened and everybody was talking about Haven. And somebody asked me, you know, um, Steve, you know, you're talking about all this stuff. Aren't you as a CEO of Jefferson worried about, about Amazon, JP Morgan, and Berkshire. And I said, well, actually, it's like the Loch Ness Monster. If I ever saw it, I'd be worried about it. I don't think I'll see it in my lifetime. Well, you know, so what happened is about four or five months ago, they abandoned that project. And, and now, now Amazon Health has said, we're going to do it alone. And again, all the telehealth stocks went down. All the insurance stocks went down. They're going directly to employers. And we'll see. I think there's some things about big tech that frankly make it harder. First of all, people don't trust them. And you know, the one thing that I've learned is trust is more important than technology. People trust their doctor. People in some respects trust their health system, much less their insurance company. But at the bottom is government and, and, you know, the big, and big tech. So, so, you know, do you really want to give your, all your genomic data to Amazon and Apple and Google and Microsoft and trust that they'll, that they'll keep it confidential? I think, I think that's going to be a problem. So I think the reason that we're excited about our relationship with General Catalyst is it all goes through us. I'll give you an example, Chris. We did the largest, we took our 32,000 employees with a company called Color Genomics, did the largest free total clear genomic testing. And we saved lives. We, people found that rare genetic things that if they had done something differently might have saved their life. But here was the key. We basically told every patient that opted in that they get the data. We're not even sharing it with their doctor. They had to opt in at every step of the way. Do you want us to share it with your doctor? Yes. Is it okay if we use it for research? You know, and, and any way they could say no. They could say, no, I, I want to get it. I don't even want my doctor to know about it. Just leave me alone. And because they believed us and trusted us, and because we had such an enhanced consent type model, they were willing to move forward with it. Look, there's a great segue into the next polling question. If we could pull that up. And who is going to get health assurance done? If everybody can make their selections. The hint is probably not the first one, that's for sure. So 
see what those results are coming at. You were right. All right. So 4% said government, 47% uh, current healthcare organizations, and 67% entrepreneurs. Let's go in reverse orders. What are the entre entrepreneurs going to do for us? Well, you know, look, I, I think, you know, if I was going to say one thing I'm most proud of is um, that I and we, Jefferson, now have a foot in both camps. I'm on the board of, of, of four startup companies that are really revolutionizing care. We brought General Catalyst and, and people like Andreessen Horowitz into our tent. We have actually somebody from General Catalyst who's on my cabinet. We formed a company together called Tendo to actually make patient care better. So, so I think I think the the combination, you know, if you had a fourth one said the combination of entrepreneurs and current healthcare organizations, that would have been the best one. Because um, I think the problem with entrepreneurs to this point has been that they're a very app-driven uh, uh, model. So, you know, we go to this meeting every year, which is the Health Information Management Society. 30,000 people pre-COVID would go. And you have 950 24-year-olds giving you a Hershey kiss and saying, if you buy my app, I'm going to transform healthcare. And I always laugh. I say, look, Junior, you know, you might transform your wallet, but you ain't transforming healthcare. You know, so what I think people like Kmon believe and Andreessen and Horowitz and others is we have to create a portfolio of things and work together with the move fast and break things folks and um, and um, uh, the current healthcare organization. So, you know, our, our mission is we improve lives. How can I, how can technology help me improve lives? The call I had right before this was with a general catalyst company called CityBlock that's actually going after social determinants. That's basically, you know, and it's been well funded. And how do I get at the people at home? You know, we're looking at a partnership with Novartis, taking the poorest areas of, of uh, Philadelphia and going to barber shops and that kind of thing to get to get people that are underserved to have healthier habits. Because 80% of your health is what we spend 10% of, uh, of money on. We spend a lot of money on hospitals and that kind of thing. So I think. I think that, you know, I think that that combination, I said that, look, the issue with government is, uh, the best way to put it is, um, I was on a cable news show and I said, the pandemic has proven that Bernie Sanders was 100% right about the problem. And the pandemic has proven that Bernie Sanders was 100% wrong about the solution. So, you know, he gets an A for saying, you know, um, you know we have this sick care, corporate driven, you know, hospital-driven, insurer-driven, pharma-driven model that isn't patient-centered. I think, yeah, he's right. He get an A for that. I think the pandemic has also proven his solution of three words, basically Medicare for all. Oh, we'll just count on the federal government, the states and the counties to get together because they all love each other to come up with a, uh, a coordinated way of running this $3.8 trillion industry. Well, I think the pandemic has proven that's a joke. I mean, the vaccine distribution, we, we exist at Jefferson in 10 counties and two states. There are certain things that if I did in one county, what they told me I had to do would be against the law in another county. So you can imagine how your brain would explode as a patient or my brain would explode as, as, a, as a provider if that same mentality of every different health director coming up with how they're going to run your system uh, went beyond COVID. We're going to do the third poll question. Um, it kind of brings us back up to 40,000 feet. And it's, the question is, what it, what's an individual's greatest risk for getting COVID-19? Poor choices, not wearing a mask, not physical distancing, genetic predisposition, or a zip code. So we'll just give that a couple of seconds for the results. I think you have to emphasize on the greatest there because probably all four of them have some have some uh I mean, you need like a like a jeopardy thing or, or a drum roll or yeah a little song in the background it's the da, next da, 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 da. ah here we go uh, pretty uh, i was gonna say pretty even but not wearing a mask came in at 37 percent not physical distancing came in at 30%. Genetic predisposition was 13%. And zip code was 56%. Yeah. 
somebody actually was listening to the end of the video. Yeah, yeah look, I, I think that um, at the end of the day, you know, it's like one of those really bad SAT questions because <laughs> the emphasis was on greatest, obviously all four of them. But yeah, I mean, the simple fact is that, um, that in Philadelphia, um, you know, there are three zip codes where you had the, by far the most chance of, of being hospitalized and dying from COVID, even if you did all the right stuff. It has to do with comorbidities, has to do with nutrition, food, education, housing, and it also has to do with connectivity. And, you know, as I said in the video, I think, you know, I think it's, a, it's just a sin that 22% um, of Philadelphians do not have connectivity. And we think about the things that saved, you know, people with COVID, telehealth, online education, they didn't have access to that. And that 20% that is not 20% across the board. It might be you know, 50% in certain zip codes and 2% in other zip codes. And I think, I think that, that's the biggest challenge we have and the least talked about challenge we have you know, in this country as it relates to how we're gonna have a different healthcare system. So that ties into the, the, the very wealthy to the very poor and the, and the difference in healthcare where you know, we're spending upwards of $700 million on, on this new building. And yet there's millions of people that are below the poverty level that are looking for basic care. You know, some may see that a, it's a gross injustice and inequity. How do you tie those two together? Yeah, so, so you know, Jefferson has 18 hospitals. Our, our whole goal is to get healthcare at home. You know, as, I mean, I mentioned this in, in, the, in the talk, but, you know, my car is in the garage sending continuous signals at night. And when I, when I started, it says, oh, by the way, Steve, while you were sleeping, you know, I, uh, uh, my right front passenger tire got a little low, fill it up. And meanwhile, you know, we're still dealing with having to go to the hospital or, or the office. So, so we recognize that we're in this nexus of change from a hospital-driven care to a, to a, um, to a health care at home piece. So, so what we had to do is think about what was gonna be obvious 10 years from now, because you guys know better than I do how long it takes to build these buildings. So I view this building at the point that we'll have less hospitals and less offices as a space station between healthcare at home and, and traditional hospitals. I believe the only thing that will be done in traditional hospitals are ICU beds, bone marrow transplants, pancreatic cancer, the really, really things. And those people won't care about what app you have. I think that most other things will be done at home or, or very close to home. But then you need something where somebody, let's say, that needs a hip replacement or whatever can go to. It's not going to be at home. It needs to be a very different environment than a traditional hospital. Why do we have hospital-acquired infections? Because you're taking that person, 45-year-old, that's getting a hip replacement in the same place as somebody who has you know, HIV or has a bone marrow transplant, is immunocompromised. It's all part of the same thing. It just doesn't make any sense. So this will, be a, this will be a place where totally tech enabled, where you'll come in, retinal scan will know who you are. You won't get that ridiculous stuff of somebody saying, fill this out, you know, and asking you all these questions and then send you over to radiology like 10 feet away. And then you go and, and they go, who are you? Fill this out. So wait, I'm the same person I was 10 feet ago. Like, like you know, figure it out. Everything will be retinal scan. Get in the elevator, they'll know exactly where you're going. The doctors will go to where you are. If you need to see a neurologist, neurosurgeon, you know, and, 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 and psychologist, they'll come to where you are instead of having to go to three or four different floors. We've even, we're even working with a company, as, as some of you guys know, where we're actually, one of the problems with EMRs, electronic medical records, are the first technology in the history of the universe that you need more humans just to get back to where you were in the doctor-patient relationship. Because now doctors are sitting at a computer and not looking at patients. So what we're doing is we're working with a company that I'll be looking at you as a patient and literally on the, on the white wall behind there, everything you say and everything I say will actually be on there. So I can look at you and I don't have to write anything down or get to a computer. So I view this building as actually being that space station for everybody. And, and more and more care being at home for the underserved will allow them to not have to come there as often. So I, I think it actually fits very, very, very well. Instead of just building, you know, a billion dollar, you know, monolith hospital uh, that's just, you know, has nicer wallpaper than what I had before. So when they go to value engineer all of those features out, you're going to be my first phone call. <laughs> got it, got it. Can you talk a little bit about, again, at the space station, there's some really cool AI things. The one that we've talked about in our prior meetings was, I really want the t-shirt. 
Can you talk a little bit about what, what AI and, and what that messaging and information transfer is all about and the different avenues that, that are out there? Yeah, so, um, so you know, I had a chance to work uh, at Apple uh, pre-iPhone and, you know, Steve Jobs used to talk about the old math and the new math. The old math was, um, was computers and operating systems. The new math was this weird thing back in the early 2000s called digital lifestyle. By the way, Apple stock was 15 back then, 27 splits ago. And no, I didn't keep my options or, or, or <laughs> I wouldn't be talking, I, I'd own JBNB. But, um, <laughs> but, you know, the fact is that we have to look at how AI can start to really help us get healthcare at home. So one of our most successful things at Jefferson this year, Jefferson merged a traditional healthcare university with the number three fashion design university. We put that together and we created a fiber, what used to be the Philadelphia College of Textiles and Sciences, carbonizing hemp to create a wearable. So this is called Hemp Black. And basically the goal will be, you'll be asleep at night it will monitor your heart rate, your respiratory rate, your sleep patterns. So when you get up and go to your Alexa and say, uh, let's say you have asthma and you go to your Alexa and say, hey, could you play the daily podcast? It'll say, well, well not so fast, Chris. Your respiratory rate was a little bit uh, labored last night. Here's the uh, EQI, here's the, the pollen count in Philadelphia. Could you take an extra inhaler then I'll play the daily podcast. We actually have the technology for that to happen. And I think, so, so to me, that's where AI will send continuous data of our whole population. If you look about AI, and we just, I just did an interview with the head of Google Health. I mean, it could take 20 billion data sets an hour and figure out which ones have to go to the doctor. So at the end of the day, literally anybody that has atrial fibrillation would never die again because what would happen is it would be able to filter out, you know what? This person has had a couple of premature precure contractions while they were sleeping. It would notify an ambulance or whatever and send them to you. The example I gave in the pandemic is, you know, literally if your fever went up during that pandemic, it would send a note to your employer. It, your 3D printer would, would print a COVID test and, and those things would happen. That technology actually exists. It's just putting it all together. And, and, and the specialty care pavilion will be really, again, the, the bridge to that technology at home versus a hospital. No, it really is, and it's it's obviously the whole world is welcoming it. You know, nothing it ties into the cost model. Nothing's more frustrating to have to go back to a doctor just for to take your blood pressure because he put you on a different medication. You know, just for some some basic data that could be done at home and and shot up into the cloud and and evaluated over a, a you know a telehealth conference. I mean, the other thing that 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 I've been really obsessed with is the concept of consumer segmentation. I mean, you guys have to do that in the building industry, right? What you're building for a small office is going to be very different than what you're building at SCP. And, um, you know, so, so, but we, we never looked at it that way. I always laugh when I go up and down the expressway and see like Pleasantville General Hospital, we are patient-centered. And I feel like calling that hospital and say, oh, I'm so happy you're patient-centered. Are you patient-centered no, no, for a 67-year-old with an aura ring and two Apple watches? Are you patient-centered for a 26-year-old disengaged person? Or a 75-year-old person that only uses her, that has cancer, only uses her computer to see her grandkids? Which one of those are you patient-centered for? You know, Amazon can tell you that based on their 1,892,000 ways that they view different consumers and what notices they send to you, Chris, versus what notices they send to me. So, so we started to look at that very differently and consumer segmenting how we get out to folks in a very different way. So, so but, the, but the, the one simple thing is that very few people, other than people actively getting operated on whatever, view themselves as patients. Again, they view themselves as people that want to be able to, and you know, people say, oh, Steve, that's stupid. You know, there's no company that's going to make, make that happen. Well, Haymont's company, Lavongo, which doesn't really make a product, took diabetics and said, you know what? How about if we don't view you as a patient? How about if we keep you at home? And how about if we help you not have to think about your diabetes? What do you think about that? And, and they, within four years, became an $18.4 billion company. So, and, you know, and that's all AI, that's all software, et cetera. So, so I think people, you know, people, I believe consumers, you folks out there that are watching this are about to have your I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore moment, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and I think the, the combination of 
you looking at what's happening in other industries and saying, why well, can't healthcare do that? The combination of some of us starting to offer that, the combination of people coming from the outside, the entrepreneurs and saying, why are you accepting waiting 45 minutes for a doctor, you know, and you're in, or who you're going to, and we'll guarantee that somebody will see you within five minutes. I think as those things start to happen, you know, I, as I said, I want to be target of Walmart because, you know, when Amazon happened, you know, literally um, some people say, oh my God, nobody's ever going to the store again. I have to be all you. Well, they didn't make it. Think Circuit City. You know, Sears and Panties said, what a stupid fad. People are going to do their Christmas shopping at home. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, yeah, they did, Sears and Panties, and you're doomed. And, you know, Target and Walmart said, we're really damn good at what we do, but I got to get into this. And in one case, they bought an each company. In one case, they, 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 they made it. That's what we're saying at Jefferson. You know what? Because people say, oh, so Steve, you're, you're not going to be hospitals. No. If you have pancreatic cancer, if you need a bone marrow transplant, if you have a stroke, the best place you can be is Thomas Jefferson University Hospital. And you know what? And, and, and our other hospitals. And, and those people, frankly, aren't concerned about what the app is or, or what the, the, the TV size is or even what the food is. But the other 97% of people, the way I look at it is, if they are tied to me while they're healthy or while their chronic disease is being handled, and they have the app when they get sick, they're not gonna go up and down the school expressway to see whether us or Penn have a cooler billboard. They're gonna say, I'm part of the Jefferson wellness team and, and, and that's where I'm gonna go. So that, that's the future that I see. Gotcha. I'd like to tie two things that we talked about already. Disruption, right? We're talking about people's lives. It's not like a retail store coming in and try to you know, sell things you know, while you're sitting on your couch at home and technology. So the question is, is technology ready for health assurance? Or do we be, need more things to be invented? I'm sorry, could you ask that again? Is technology ready for health assurance? Or do we need more things to be invented? Um, I, I, think it's, I think it's both. I mean, I think that um, there's a ridiculous amount of money being poured into, into, um, into healthcare. I'm, the, I'm on the board of a SPAC, a Special Purpose Acquisition Corp that was named after our book. Health Assurance Acquisition Corp. It's with Haymon and the guy that started Lovango Glenn. And, you know, I mean, there's no problem getting money. It's, and I think what I love about this SPAC and some of the other things that I'm on the uh, board of, is it's really transforming healthcare. So, you know, one company I'm on the board of is an Israeli company that's moving obstetric monitoring from the hospital to the home. Well, that's going to make a big difference. My daughter had a, a pregnancy during the pandemic and she had to go into the hospital three times a week. She could afford to spend $35 to park three times a week and take off from work, but somebody else couldn't. They couldn't, they couldn't get a nanny or they couldn't afford to pay, you know, come down there or they couldn't get off from work. So they just don't get the non-stress test. So, so I think that that's, um, to me, that I think it's a combination of both. There's a couple of good questions on the Q&A, Chris, if I can go through them. Um, one of the questions is, what are your thoughts about proactive monitoring of DNA or other markers uh, to identify trends such as COVID um, in defined communities so that outreach can be done and care options provided to avoid emergency room visits. Sure. Uh, it's from a guy named uh, Neil. Um, so Neil, I, I think that um, I think that that's going to be the answer. I think the, the whole concept of, of having your, your, your entire genome mapped and be part of what folks do and then going and saying, in this particular zip code, we have this group of people that's got a higher risk of prostate cancer. So let's change that environmental factor. I think the biggest problem so far though, is, is, is gets back to that trust issue. You know, yeah. you know, um, you know, Google, Google, just to give you an example, had this amazing contact tracing model, but nobody would use it because in order to do it, you had to basically tell, basically hand over everything to Google, everything you were doing, every, they knew if you were in the bedroom, they knew, you know, what you're doing. And nobody, nobody wanted to do that. So I think the question becomes, you know, how much privacy are you willing to give up to, to, to be able to proactively look at that? I'll give you a company, one of the companies I'm on the board of, uh, it's called Mindstrong, it's people with serious mental illness who have been admitted and have done some, you know, whether it's opioid or, 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 or harming themselves or whatever. And they agree to get all their digital footprinting monitored. That, so it's an opt-in thing. And we can, it's a, for those of you who see Minority Report, it's a little Minority Report-ish, you know, of we can almost predict who's going to go off. And then we, we, through telehealth, say, you know what? We'd like you to come in and, and be seen. Well, I feel fine. Well, remember when you signed up for this, you know, we can predict. So I think some of that will happen, but it's got to be a situation where people understand what they're giving up by doing it. 
do you think that trust factor is actually going to come about in the near term or do you think it's going to take a long time to get there i think it'll i think it won't happen at big i think i don't think it'll happen from big tech i think it'll happen from doctors and you know like the example i give with color genomics i think we'll start to look at sort of what we call reality based uh, trust that people will, will will give us a chance to um, um, to bring in some of these entrepreneurs and that will go to me and say, Steve, you're my doctor. I want you to tell me that that's not going to be abused. And, you know, obviously we'll have to make sure that's going to happen. Um, Zoe asked the question, what's Jefferson doing in the physical space to address the nurse burnout? I think that's a, a, a really, really, really great question. And I think it's both uh, <laughs> physical and metaphysical. Um, and I think it's not just nurse burnout, it's, 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 it's employee burnout. I mean, the COVID, if you just can imagine, what it was like, and I just want people to recognize it. It's like literally being on the front line of a war. And then difference being you go home and your family's on the front line of the war, you know, during these surges. So I think um, I think the, the, the way we're looking at the specialty care pavilion is that uh, our goal is to have daycare. Our goal is to have places, you know, our goal is to turn the specialty care pavilion into a community center of well-being. You know, we're going to be, we have a, a genius bar, but in the genius bar, we'll be doing healthy food lessons. We'll be inviting our employees to bring their families in for some of these healthy food lessons. On Saturdays and Sundays, we'll be telling clubs to come there and we'll take your blood pressure. So the goal is to have our nurses and our employees feel they're part of a whole community at the specialty care pavilion. And it's more than just a job. Gotcha. You want to keep going through these because I have a couple other questions. I could weave them in and out of some of the yeah. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, we got, we have some other questions on the on the board too. So um, one from Steve Friedman. Post COVID, can you share your approach on the workplace transformation relative to the remote working environment? Can it be effectively successful or a what man? Path a for potential failure. path for failure. Yeah. Um, okay. um, that's a really good question, and I think there will be PhDs uh, written on that. And I'm dealing with that right now. You know, I mentioned, you know, I have 32,000 employees. You know, our chief human resource officer is really looking at a back to work environment. And, I, and, and I'm of two minds, and I think we'll end up with a hybrid approach. Um, I'm of one mind that, um, you know, something is really missing by not having that human interaction. And um, and I'm afraid that it'll become too easy to, to just say, I can, I can work from home. So I'd be, I've just looked at it from the, you know, 10 or 11 people that report to me uh, up in, you know, we're, we're in 1101 market. And, you know, uh, those folks have all been vaccinated. And, you know, someone said, well, you know, why don't we just, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a waste for me to drive 45 minutes, you know, come in, drive 45 minutes back. I'm wasting an hour and a half, Steve. I'm not being as productive. So I'm thinking, well, if that was the case, why did we have an office to begin with? Because that was true even pre-COVID. So I think on, on one mind, I'm saying we have to get back into a mindset of what really, why did we have humans get together? You know, yeah. what's the difference between three-dimensional interaction? And what's, you know, on the other hand, I, it will definitely never go back to the way it was. You know, and, and I'll give you our example. You know, we have, because we have 18 hospitals and two campus university, when we would do like an all- you know, uh, an all nurse town hall or all nurse manager town hall, we would do it downtown. We have to have like 300 people come downtown and, you know, and, and drive in and park and, you know, um, you know, to pretty much hear what's going on and ask some questions. Well, that, that's ridiculous now to ever do again in person. Um, you know, so I, th I, think, I think there will be, I think there will be hi uh, hybrid models. Um, um, I, I, if I could, I'd like to answer this one very interesting question because I've done a lot of thought thinking about that. And that's from Christine, if you want to, you see Christine. Christine, Q, uh, yeah, fantastic yeah. presentation. Can't wait to read the book. What are your thoughts on life work balance for physicians? As patients have more access to their physician, it seems that the physician is always on. Amen. We yes. see that in our industry. Yes. So, well. so so I'll, I'll tell you a story. I, I got really friendly with um, before he died with Jack Welsh, and um, and his his um, his wife Susie Welsh um, had done a lot of work on that, and and she had a great comment, and I very very much believe it. Was, work life balance does not exist. It's work life choices. Mm -hmm. 
And I think if, if, if you know, and, 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 I, and I tell that to my docs all the time, and, you know, frankly, my employees all the time, it's work-life choices, you know, and, you know, the key is, you know, to make the choices that, that you're not going to regret later. And, and Susie had written a book, um, I think it was called 10 Hours, uh, you know, 10 Months and 10 Years. And when you have to make a decision around work-life choice, how are you going to feel 10 hours from then? How are you going to feel 10 months from then? And how are you going to feel 10, 10 years from then? And yeah, it's called 10, 10, 10. And she gave a great example of, you know, she ended up becoming the editor of Harvard Business Review, but uh, when it was up, when it was between her and, and somebody else, she, um, um, you know, uh, the, it, it was a really tight race of who was going to become the editor. And the current editor had to go off someplace and said, Susie, great news. You know, I'm going to have to go. We need a presentation to the board. I'm going to let you give that presentation to the board. It turns out it was like her 12-year-old son's judo brown belt thing. And she missed all the other yellow, green, whatever. And, you know, her first reaction was, of course, you know, wow, this means I'll probably get chosen. I, I've got to do it. And she thought about it in the 10, 10, 10. And she said, you know, you know, you know, yeah, I think, you know, because my son will say, it's okay, mom, I understand. So that was not a problem. So probably in the 10 hours should be okay. Maybe even 10 months, 10 years from then, um, she'd say, you know, I can't believe I missed that. I can't believe I made that choice. So she went in, what was interesting is she went into her boss and the first thing it was like, are you kidding me? You're, you're not gonna take this opportunity? Let me tell you, and then she said, let me tell you how I'm thinking of it and why. She ended up getting the, the editorship and the boss said, you know, the fact that you gave me that sort of rationale really made a lot of sense. So I think, I think I believe that. I think what we've tried to go to our docs is give them flexible work schedules. I think telehealth has helped. I think especially among uh, our women physicians, I'm an OBGYN and women OBGYNs are more and more doing, you know, almost like uh, together will be one FTE. So, you know, my, myself and my counterpart will, will be a five day or six day a week thing, but, you know, we'll figure it out. You, know, you can know that one of us one of us will be there. Um, so I, I think, I think we're, we're trying at Jefferson to be, um, uh, you know, we're, we're trying at Jefferson to be um, um, sort of very flexible that way. There's a question from Charles about where I'm gonna locate and build my 2030 spaceship. Um, definitely Jupiter, um, you know, it's like I'm, I'm in Miami now and it's all about the view. Um, uh, it's all about the view. And, um, you know, if you, if you, if you, watch, follow your astronomy, the view from Jupiter's, you know, the rings are just going to be Saturn, Jupiter, one of those two. You want to go back to technology? Matt's got a question here, and it's actually one that I had myself. When technology is the basis for many of the transformations you're suggesting, how do we help to bridge the economic gap between patient outcomes when lower income patients will often lack equivalent access to this technology? Yeah, so look, I think, um, I think uh, I just wrote an article, you know, called Connectivity is a Vital Sign. So actually tomorrow I have a meeting with the leaders of Comcast uh, on the World Economic Forum. We have a project called the Edison Project to have literally connectivity and broadband be viewed like electricity and plumbing. So I think the, the answer is that we, ha we have to get, we have to get the majority or all of the population connected. The concept of somebody not being connected, they are virtually and technologically homeless. So Matthew is 100% is right. Once that happens, though, once connectivity is a utility, then I think the whole thing changes because then I can start to work with companies like City Block, et cetera, that are looking at that, those folks that literally we can change their behavior. Let me give you an example of one of the uh, discussions I've had with the CEO of UPS. Think about food deserts. Again, as I said in the thing, food deserts exist because of zip codes and who, where you can walk to. Well, in 2021, that's asinine, right? So drone delivery will fundamentally change that, okay? But the, the, the person is gonna have to have, you know, connectivity to know when, when the drone is dropping the package, et cetera. So I do believe, I do believe, um, I do believe we will get to a connectivity for all stage. I think in the video I said, the Connectivity Act of 2023. It's one of the things that bothers me about government because they're not talking enough about that. Uh, but I think once that happens, you'll see a lot of companies start to look at the social determinants of health. 
And sticking with the healthcare, uh, the with the technology topic, um, Beth's got a question. How to make sure the hype in healthcare AI results in concrete and useful applications in grassroots level healthcare? Yeah, so um, the way I'd look at AI, you know, look, you, you, you use the right word, Beth, hype. I mean, right now, I could start a company tomorrow, go on the internet, if it has A and I in the same sentence, I'll get $100 million worth of funding. Okay, so, so yeah, it's ridiculous. Um, but I think it's gonna be like, if you think about, you know, some of the folks probably aren't as old as I am, but you know, um, when you think about the search world, you know, what were the first ones? CompuServe, Ask Jeeves, you know, you know Google was, was, was certainly not the first one to the party, right? But they were, they were able to really look and say, how do I make this indispensable? Getting back to Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs' whole thing was, you know, when he came out with the iPod, you know, and said, I'm going to build a company around this. Literally, people said, you're either crazy or on drugs. You know, he was on drugs, but he wasn't crazy. You know, you're going to build this company around holding 200 MP3s. No, he's going to build this company about getting information, you know, out to people at home. So I think, I think what you'll see is the companies that will make it, there'll be a lot of, you know, early companies that don't make it. The companies that make it will be the ones like Google that were able to create longitudinal pieces and go well beyond search. So if you look at Teladoc, which is a company we work with, they acquired Lovongo, they acquired InTouch Health. And I, I would say, and I don't know if the CEO of Teladoc would put it this way, but they don't want to be a telehealth company because that's good. That's going to be a commodity. That's why, you know, their stock's gone down with Amazon getting into telehealth. They want to be a management of chronic disease company. Well, of which telehealth is, is, is one component. So I think what you'll start to see is, you know, those kind of, those kind of things happen and, and we'll, we'll narrow, we'll narrow the, uh, uh, the ones that are gonna make it. That, that's what happens in any major, you know, transformation like that. And it's not gonna be one silver bullet. It's just gonna be a, a, an arrangement of a number of things that play off one another. And how do they share? I guess there, there's gonna be a way to, for them to share data across different platforms you know, as you're getting AI data off of that T-shirt, perhaps, yeah. right? Does it schedule yeah. automatically access your calendar? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah that's a great question also, because I think that the, the whole issue, EMRs have done a really lousy job of that. Yeah. And frankly, healthcare providers, and we've all done a lousy job of that. You know, so, you know, insurers, you know, if I want to reduce my readmissions and get all the data of any of my patients and where they've gone, they won't give me data from somebody that left me and went to Penn or went to mainline health because they don't want me to know what they paid mainline health. You know, traditionally Epic hasn't wanted to share data with Cerner, you know, Cerner systems, et cetera. So I think, you know, there's a lot of discussion about, um, there's a guy named Anish Chopra who I partner with a lot. He was the chief technology officer for, um, uh, for President Obama. And, you know, he talks about total interoperability that there ought to be an absolute, you know, law you know, that, 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 that it's easy to interoperable. One of the things that we need, I'm not a big regulation person, but, but we, have to, we have to get out of some of this. Every state has a different thing. Um, so I can practice physically in 48 states. I can only do telehealth in 14 states. Why? Because like certain state medical sites said you can't do telehealth unless you're, you know, in this state. Well, it's asinine. It'd be like when, when, when banking became democratize, you said you need a different ATM card for every state with a different code. It, it, it wouldn't have gotten that, that way. So I think the key is gonna be, you know, how we start to reliably are able to share data. Now the, the personal data will go into sort of a, a data warehouse. It'll be, it'll be um, de-identified unless something's wrong and then it'll get to the right person. That, that there's a lot of a lot of companies working on exactly how that gets done. Then the person's gonna to have to feel comfortable that it's really de-identified. Um, and you know, there's a lot of work to be done on that. There's a lot of companies that are doing that, but I believe we will get to that point. Okay. We have four minutes left and I'm starting to hear some light Oscar music in the background. So we have two questions left. Uh, Oscar is asking a good question. Uh, if Dr. Clasco, if you were to reimagine community scale healthcare, how do you think that would look like? European models are great where people know and deal with the same doctor all the time, but how do you institutionalize that model where you have multiple providers? Is there a competitive model for this? 
Yeah, so Oscar, I'd be glad to tell you all about the global differences in healthcare in the next two minutes. Um, <laughs> but it's actually a good question. The simple answer to your last piece is um, there's no perfect model. If there was, we'd all do it. Um, you know, if you look at a place like Japan, they don't do as much surgery because you don't get paid much for doing surgery. You get paid per visit and prescription. So they do almost no telephone consultations. It's, you know, they write a lot of prescriptions and they, so things tend to follow the money. Um, Germany uh, does a really good job. Israel does a really good job that it has four payers. Uh, it's a very coordinated system. You know, the UK for all of the, you know, I remember when Don Berwick was up for CMS administrator and he made the mistake of saying, I think we can learn something from the UK. It was like that scene in Exorcist where his head went around 360 degrees. I can't believe you want us to become the United Kingdom. Well, they give everybody access. Nobody ever has to mortgage their house for cancer. Now, on the other hand, you know, if you need something elective, it might take a long time. So, and they do have one provider. You get a provider and that's your provider. So I think, you know, Americans want it all, right? I mean, there's a great quote, uh, what, what makes a, 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 an American doctor great is, is, is his or her focus on the individual. By definition, that makes them a poor allocator of resources. You know, or I think Hillary Clinton once said, everybody wants managed care for everybody other than themselves and their family. So the question for us is for a lower cost, how much of that individualism, I want an MRI, not a, not a CAT scan. I want to go to this doctor at Penn and this doctor at Jefferson and this doctor at Mayline. By the way, if, I, if I'm not sure I like this doctor at Mayline, I want to go to this doctor at Penn. Oh, and I want somebody else to pay for it. Um, you know, oh, and I, by the way, I want my healthcare costs to go down. So you know, <laughs> that, that model doesn't exist worldwide or in any, any planet. Okay. And, um, and the last question is, is about real estate. Minute warning, exactly. Okay. What happens with uh, health systems, massive real estate holdings when care shift towards the home? Yeah, I, I think it's a great question. It's something that I think, well, you know, if you're going to have a follow-up uh, thing to this, we'll be getting together with some really smart strategic real estate people and some really smart strategic healthcare people. Because I think what we're going to do is have to repurpose things. So when we think about an aging population, and we think about, you know, we're going to have too many hospitals. You know, I think moving some hospitals to assisted living facilities with healthcare inside, um, moving some to skilled nursing facilities. We're working with a large home health model. I think so. I think what we what we'll want to be able to do is say, what do we do with four walls in this new model if we're going to need 30% less beds? And how can we flex those, those walls if there's another pandemic? One of the great things about the specialty care pavilion, as you know, is we're creating flex walls so we can turn them into different kinds of rooms. Right. Amazing. Dr. Clasco, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful discussion, tremendous insight. Um, we made it right on the button, 625. Um, Oscar music has stopped. So again, I wanted to thank you for your time. Uh, again, amazing discussion. All the attendees, thank you for hanging in there on this like I said, 81 and sunny, beautiful day here in Miami. Um, but uh, I, most folks are across the, uh, the, the Northeast. So I, I hear it's fairly nice up there well, as, as well. Um, I just want to put out a special thank you to our wonderful clients, Jefferson Health and National Real Estate Development. Uh, true gentlemen on both sides of the equation. Uh, it, you know, it was wonderful dealing with both of them in, 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 in developing the client shell documents and the fit out documents. Great communication between the two teams, it's a wonderful clients. And it couldn't have happened without an amazing group of professionals uh, between architects and engineers and everybody in between, uh, truly amazing group of professionals. So I just wanted to thank everybody uh, on the design team for such a wonder, wonderful experience. Uh, with that, um, Janine, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Thank you, Chris. Wow, what a journey towards health for all. This has been such a tremendous process in pulling this all together and I cannot thank Dr. Clasco and his exceptional team for helping put this together. Uh, Michael Hode and Grace Hardesky, we couldn't have done this without you. Thank you so much. Um, on a final note, just two more things and we'll let you go. Um, but as for you, the first 899, um, or the, I'm sorry, for the first 100, and one registrants, as you know, you'll be receiving a signed copy of UnHealthcare that was sponsored by JBMB. Thank you so much for doing that. We are sorry for the 899 who didn't sign up in time. Um, and secondly, I would just like to leave you with a quote from UnHealthcare. This book is a call to action. 
we ask that you look at the events of early 2020 as a call to change how we provide the most important of all human rights, the right to thrive without health problems getting in the way. Now we have to build it. I implore you to read it and find out how you can help. Thank you for joining us tonight. Good night, everyone. Good night.